Hello everybody, it's the end of the year and I'm going to do my final book haul now. I'm really cold so I've got my dressing gown on so I do apologise. So these are all the books that I got in November and December because I only actually got four or five in November so I didn't want to do a book haul then. Got a few more in, November, in December because I got given one for Christmas and I got some second hand ones. So let's have a look. So the first book to look at is Harlan Coben's Miracle Cure. This was a one that my mum got, my dad got it for from the charity shop. And they were looking for a miracle cure, Sarah and Michael, the ideal celebrity couple, darlings of the media until their lives are shattered by a mystery illness. Dr. Harvey Riker, his clinic has found the miracle cure that millions seek. One by one his patients are getting well, and one by one they are targeted by a serial killer, more than more fatal than the disease. Lieutenant Bernstein, his true desires make him the perfect choice to track the killer or a perfect victim. Can anyone stop the killer who will do any, anything to prevent the world's most desperately, desperately needed miracle cure? Ooh, I do like Harlan Coben. Then I also got Christmas Carol and other Christmas writings by Charles Dickens, my classic, my last classic of the year. Everybody knows the story of a Christmas Carol in which um, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by four ghosts, Jake and Marley, the coast, the coast, Ghosts of Christmas Past, Present and Yet to Come, in which they show him what was, what is and what will be if he doesn't change his ways and become a nicer person. Lovely Christmas story and beautiful cloth bound classic book. Again, one my mum got for 50p from the charity shop, Pedigree Mum. I don't think I've read this ever. A stray husband, a town of posh, poo posh, posh pooches. Can a crazy rescue dog mend a broken heart? Probably, because dogs pretty much can cure every ill, along with cats. When Kerry Tam Tambini up sticks with her family to a new home on the coast, she couldn't have been happier. Then husband Rob made the biggest mistake of his life. Stranded with her children in snooty shawling, Kerry has plenty on her plate. So how can she say no to the kids' pleas for a dog when they're missing their father dreadfully? As Kerry juggles hectic family life and trying to fit in with the local pedigree mums, she soon finds herself adopting a dog. But will this wayward hound lead Kerry to a new love, or has she bitten up off more than she can chew? See, I love these kind of books. This is one Paul brought home for me. I have no idea where he got it from. Charity shop, maybe, but it doesn't look like it's been read. Um, Stuart McBride, no less the devil. Funnily enough, the day he bought this, it actually turned up on his um, Facebook news feed, which is rather creepy. Um, no idea, so let's have a look. It's been 17 months since the bloodsmith butchered his first victim. Ooh, and Operation Maypole is still no nearer catching him. The media is whipping up a storm and the top brass are demanding results, but the investigation is sinking fast. Now isn't the time to get distracted with other cases, but Detective Sergeant Lucy McVeigh doesn't have much choice. When Benedict Strachan was just 11, he hunted down and killed a homeless man. And no one's ever figured out why Benedict did it, but now after 16 years, he's back on the streets Again, battered, frightened, con convinced a shadowy they are out to get the him and begging Lucy for help. It sounds like paranoia, but what if he's right? What if he's really caught up in something bigger and darker than Lucy's ever dealt with before? What if the bloodsmith isn't the only monster out there? And what's going to happen when Lucy goes after them? This is my kind of book. Ooh, yes, this is definitely my kind of book. Actually, all books are my kind of book, you know me. Um, another one from my mum, and she tell lots of them. Survivor by Leslie Pierce. I like Leslie Pierce. It's 1938, historical fiction, and headstrong 18-year-old Mary Carrera is fleeing a scandal in rural New Zealand. Sounds familiar. Aboard the SS Rumutaka. But once in the care of her godfather in London, Mary succumbs to the temptations of the glittering West End. Who wouldn't? Then war comes and snatches it all away. As the Blitz rains death on London, Mary's life is blown apart. Lost and alone in the burning East End, she learns that to enjoy this spoil, she must find strength, selflessness and compassion locked within her. And soon the born survivor must put her life on the line for others. Yeah, my mum loves those historical fictions, especially ones set around World War II. So I quite enjoy them myself. The next one again, second hand one that somebody picked up for me, probably my mum or Paul, he seems to do that a lot, is The Woman Inside by E.G. Scott. It's not a very big one. Rebecca didn't know love was possible until she met Paul, a man with a past as dark as her own. But 20 years later, the damage and secrets that drew them together now threatened to tear them apart. 
When Paul catches the attention of the police after two women go missing, Rebecca discovers Paul's elaborate plan to build a new life without her. And though Rebecca is quickly spiraling out of control, it doesn't stop her hatching a devastating plot of her own to get revenge. They made a promise to each other, after all, till death do us part. And now the cat's knocking all the books down. Here she is, it's my baby. It's my Zed. Yeah, she's so sweet. You all right? She's been up on the window. <laughs> the window's open, so she sits on the top of it. Let me pick up these ones that have just fallen down, and then I can do those. They all go in everywhere. Oh. There's only a couple more um, of this pile. Then I've a pile of Marilyn books as well. So, next one is The Keeper by David Baldacci. Now, I like his um, thrillers. This isn't a thriller. Ugh, this is a fantasy by the sound of it. Uh, I think this is book one in the Vega Jane series. So Vega Jane was always told no one could leave the town of Wormwood. She was told there was nothing outside but the quag, a wilderness filled with danger and death. And she believed it until the night she stumbled across a secret which proved that everything she knew was a lie. The quag would throw everything at Vega, it will try and break her, it will try to kill her, and survival might come at a price not even Vega is willing to pay. Actually, it's the sequel to the bestseller in The Finisher, so I will get The Finisher before I read this one. There's no rush. I've got 200 odd books to read before I get to that one. The next one is a very thin book that's got slightly water damage because Jen had water by the bed and spilt, fell, it fell over and spilt on it, but it's fine. And it's called Rudolph Valentino's Strange Afterlife. Historical articles compiled by Kevin Scott Collier. And it's literally what it says on the tin. Um, from the accounts of Crypt Keeper Roger C. Peterson, Valentino's widow Natasha Rambova, entertainment reporter Ruth Beery and much more. Valentino's life beyond the grave begins so it's all sorts of like news articles and things and magazine articles there's, there's even if I can find one um photographs of the magazine covers there's one there photo play as you can see it's all slightly waterlogged it wasn't very expensive so I'm not too worried um next a uh, new ripper book for the collection i've got tons of ripper books to continue reading but this one is the true face of jack river by melvin harris this is actually the third melvin harris book i've got and i haven't read any of them yet so it might be a melvin harris uh, kind of uh, year next year this man had inside information of the murders almost uh, of the murders he almost certainly murdered his wife he was a trained killer he had some medical knowledge was suspected of being jack the ripper <coughs> by his mistress and four other independent witnesses had a bolt hole one minute's walk away from the first murder this man was Jack the Ripper um it doesn't say anything else about it just about this one um yeah I'm interested to find out I don't know who this man is but I will I'm looking forward to that one the next one is an ex-library book it has discard on it <laughs> Um, it's a novel called A Touch of Stardust by Kate Alcott. It is set during, it, it's set in Hollywood, basically. So I love the cover. I love that cover. Look at that. So glamorous. Um, basically, when Julie Crawford leaves Fort Wayne, Indiana, for Hollywood, she never imagines she'll cross paths with Carol Lombard, the dazzling actress from Julie's provincial Midwestern hometown. The young woman has dreams of becoming a screenwriter, but the only job Julie is able to find is one in the studio publicity office of the notoriously demanding producer David O. Selznick, who is busy burning through directors, writers and money as he films Gone with the Wind. Although tensions run high on set, Julie finds she can step onto the back lot, take in the smell of smoky gunpowder and the soft rustle of hoop skirts and feel the magical world of Gone with the Wind come to life. Julie's access to real life magic comes when Carol Lombard hires her as an assistant and invites her into the glamorous world Carol shares with Clark Gable, who is about to move into movie history as the dashing Rhett Butler. Carol Lombard, happily profane and uninhibited, which we, we all know is true, makes no secret of her relationship with Gable, which poses something of a problem for the studio because Gable is technically still married. And the last thing the film needs is more negative publicity. Julie is there to fend off the overly curious reporters, hoping to prevent details about the affair from slipping out, <coughs> but she can barely keep up with her blonde employer, let alone control what comes out of Carol's mouth. And as their friendship grows, Julie finds that she doesn't want to she doesn't want to carol both wise and funny becomes julie's model for breaking free of the past i just love the idea of this this is this is actually 
from the Boylston Public Library. So it's from America. And it's actually got a little thing in the back. These are things they used to stamp. But now it says, use this to mark that you've read this book. Who could ever forget reading a book like this? I, I don't know. There you go. One for my permanent collection, I'm sure. Another one for the permanent collection. This is a Christmas present and I'm so excited to get to this this new year. Madly DP, the Alan Rickman Diaries. So, we all know who Alan Rickman was. So Alan Rickman remains one of the most beloved actors of all time across almost every genre. From his breakout role as Die Hard's villainous Hans Gruber to his heart-wrenching run as Professor Severus Snape and beyond. His air of dignity, his sonorous voice and the knowing wit he brought to each role continue to captivate new audiences today. But Rickman's artistry wasn't confined to just his performances. Rickman's writing, writing details extraordinary and ordinary way that is anecdotal, indiscreet, witty, gossipy and utterly candid. He takes us behind the scenes on films and plays ranging from Sense and Sensibility, the Harry Potter series, Private Lives, My Name is Rachel Corrie and many more. The diaries run from 1993 to his death in 2016 and offer an insight to both a public and private life. Here Rickman is the consummate professional actor but also the friend, the traveller, the fan, the director, the enthusiast. In short, the real Alan Rickman. Here is a life fully lived, all details in intimate and characteristically plain spoken prose. Reading the diaries is like listening to Rickman chatting to a close friend. And Madly Deeply also includes a forward by Emma Thompson and an afterword by Alan's widow Rima Horton and a selection of Rickman's early diaries dating from 74 to 1982 when his acting life began. And he also illustrated them, which is what I think is really lovely that you get through here and every now and again, I think there might be some in the, in the, in the photo section. Was it in the photo section? Yeah, it shows you how he was such an artist that he, I don't want to break the spine, but would decorate his diary pages. I don't do that in my diaries. I barely write in my diaries. <laughs> right, on to the Marilyn and Marilyn related books. So the first one is a repurchase and this is Marilyn Private and Undiscovered by Michelle Morgan because my original copy was destroyed in the fire last year that my neighbour had because I'd lent the book to her. So I finally picked up a new copy because I had some money left from Christmas. But let's just say, meticulously researched and full of new insights into the private life of a very public superstar, Michelle Morgan tells the story of a movie actress whose fame never fades. In public, Marilyn Monroe was feted and loved, but in her private life there were controversies, conspiracies and unsolved puzzles, including rare and previous unseen images from the star's life. This book reveals a different side of Marilyn from the celluloid invention and is based on the author's extensive interviews with the main players in Monroe's life family and friends as well as work colleagues and more casual acquaintances. So I'm really happy to have this back in my Marilyn book collection. Um, I am planning a reread of as many of my Marilyn collection as I can and I'll do that in another video. I'll talk about that in another video when I'm doing my plans for next year. The next books are a little bit silly, some of them are, but the next one is called Making Their Voices Heard, The Inspiring Friendship of Ella Fitzgerald and Marilyn Monroe, words by Vivian Kirkfield and art by Alina Harris. Isn't that just a gorgeous cover? And basically the background says, Ella and Marilyn, on the outside you couldn't find two girls who look more different, but on the inside they were like, full of hopes, dreams and plans of what might be. So basically this is the story of how Marilyn and Ella Fitzgerald became friends. <clears throat> I mean, it's been told many times um, in play and other things. I do love the, the artwork. I think the artwork is just beautiful. It's, you know, it's not overtly trying to look like Marilyn, but it does on this. Well, Marilyn and Ella together there. I don't know how to find it. There we are. So this one is not going to take long to read. So I'm really looking forward to having a read of that. On the sillier side, I thought because... I just want to read it just for the sake of it. Um, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe by Nick Redfern. The most stupid title I've ever heard in my life. So, cold-hearted murders, made look like suicides and accidents, classified government documents falling into the wrong hands, explosive diaries, powerful people with dangerous agendas, government people prowling around Hollywood conspiracies, frightened people with disturbing secrets to hide, wild sex, drugs, crazy parties and flown booze. At the very heart of it all, an amazing story of UFOs, aliens, Roswell, Area 51 and the life of death of a beautiful but scarred iconic icon, none other than one of the most famous and loved actors of the 20th century, Marilyn Monroe. It gets more and more ridiculous, doesn't it, every year? So it just does. I just thought it would be something funny. Oh, there's a picture there. What's that? Oh, 
Oh, he's mentioned Milo Spiriglio, so that's, um, oh, it's some of the, the FBI pages, which I already have anyway, so. Uh, John Judge, a man who knew. Okay, I'm sure he didn't. I have my doubts, always, because facts, people, dates, documents, sources, evidence, 100% incontrovertible. That's the only thing I would accept to believe any of this nonsense. More nonsense <laughs> in the same conspiracy um, filled realm before we get on to two one fairly decent and one exceptional book well I haven't read it yet but I know it's gonna be exceptional because we've got the original so yeah and the next one is a big tome called collateral damage the mysterious deaths of Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen and the ties that bind them to Robert Kennedy and the JFK assassination by Mark Shaw now, isn't that a hell of a title Right, again, this is going on with the murder theories. I haven't even opened this book yet. There had been no cover-up of Robert Kennedy's complicity in the murder of Marilyn Monroe in 1962. Uh, there wasn't. And he had been prosecuted based on compelling evidence at the time. There wasn't any. The assassination of JFK by Bobby's enemies would not have happened in 1963, changing the course of history and preventing the murder of media icon Dorothy Kilgallen. Unlikely. In a breakthrough book that's sure to be relevant for years to come, doubtful. Best-selling author, the reporter who knew too much, again about Dorothy Kilgallen, and distinguished historian Mark Shaw investigates the connection between the mysterious deaths of motion picture screen siren Marilyn Monroe, President Kennedy, and What's My Line TV star and crack investigative reporter Dorothy Kilgallen. A former noted criminal defence attorney and network legal analyst, Shaw provides an illuminated perspective of, as to how Robert Kennedy's abuse of power during the early 60s resulted in the murders of Marilyn, JFK and Dorothy. Yes. Call me a sceptic. It's my middle name. But it should be fun to read. Uh, a slightly better book that was recently published is My Marrow by Terry Carger. However, she did pick a co-author called J. Margolis, who again is a conspiracy theorist. So the last chapter of the book is all conspiracy based. However, the subtitle is Marrow, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood and Me, forward by Michael Reagan. Pictures on the back are very nice. Um, rare pictures of Marilyn throughout. Um, debunks um, a video that came out a few years ago of them claiming that she was smoking pot. Um, actually, it was with the Carga family who were military at the time, so it definitely wasn't. It was just a cigarette they were messing around with. However, it says, Terry Carger is a child of Hollywood, the granddaughter of Metro Pictures co-founder Maxwell Carger and the daughter of Fred Carger, vocal coach at Columbia Pictures. Terry's story revolves around Fred and a trio of silver screen legends, her stepmother, Jane Wyman, Ronald Reagan, and primarily Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn, recently evolved from Norma Jean Watson, was an unknown starlet when, as a 21-year-old, she first met six-year-old Terry and began dating her dad in the spring of 1948. The orphaned, emotionally fragile actress initially babysat Fred's daughter while turning to his family for support. Although the Marilyn-Fred romance lasted just over a year, her close friendship with the Cargers, including Fred, continued for 14 years until the end of, her, of Marilyn's life. This is true. We have pictures taken over in 61, 62 of her with um, Fred Carger's mum and, and the family. While Fred was Marilyn's first true love, his mum, Nana, was the mother she never really had. Well, one of many. Uh, Marilyn, as they fun fondly called her, was allowed to relax and be herself, and it also enabled Marilyn to appease her own unfulfilled maternal instincts, acting as a cross between a sweet, playful big sister and generous, caring surrogate mom to Terry. This memoir always received privately taken, previously unpublished photos of the iconic superstar with her adopted family and friends. So yeah, there are some lovely photographs in here. The, the reproduction is not the best. Um... But yes, there are some, there's a chapter on the whole marijuana fiasco. Let's see if I can find some more. I haven't read it yet. This will be one of the first books I read. Um, but yeah, some, some of the pictures of her at the end of her life with them. And Carl Sandberg. Um, there she, there's Nana Carga just there. And on the front, she's that one there. 
So yeah, I mean, at least it is by somebody who knew, even if it was only vaguely, because she was only seven when she married Marilyn, and 14 years later would have been, what, 21 when she died. Um, at least it's still by somebody who actually met a new Marilyn. Um, the only thing that, like I said, people aren't happy about is Jane Margolis because he perpetuates the murder theories, which have been debunked so many times. It's just not funny anymore. This book came today in the next book. So did uh, Making Their Voices Heard. I will admit, two Marilyn books arrive on the same day. And it's the updated brand new edition of Marilyn Monroe, A Day in the Life by April Vivea Chambers. Now, as you see those pink tabs sticking out of it already, I haven't read it. Um, this is going to take me approximately a year to read because um, I plan on reading it every day. I'm making TikToks about certain things that happened on a specific day. So if I can say, Robert Kennedy visited Marilyn on this day, we have evidence because April wouldn't have put it in a book without evidence. Now, let's have a look at the way the book is laid out because this is gorgeous. We have different colours for different sections and periods in Marilyn's life. The end is all black pages. So 1961, 62 is black. And then there is actually a section that comes from 63 to the present day, literally. There's also sections in it, such as where it debunks certain things or talks about certain things like was Marilyn pregnant during specific times? Um, I think that's during The Prince and the Showgirl. And was Marilyn, what was this one? This one says Marilyn and the first production company. So debunking that Marilyn had the first female production company. She didn't, she wasn't nowhere near the first. She is just one of the most famous. <laughs> that, that's all it is. I mean, obviously Mary Pickford uh, formed um, her own production company and they and United Artists and uh, Mabel Normand had one and they were all sort of just go and watch classic Hollywood women on YouTube. April's channel is absolutely fabulous. So this is the book of the end of the year for me. I am so excited to read this. Those are all the books that I got in November and December. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I've got a lot to read. I have over 200 books on my physical TBR. I dread to think how many I have with my Kindle. Not that many, luckily, but there are still a few. I can't wait to get cracking with the new year. I will be filming a reading plan update fairly shortly. So I'll see you soon. Bye.